Hello there. This lecture is all about employee selection and selecting a qualified applicants is really a critical step in building a talented and committed workforce. It's also important to supporting an effective organizational organizational culture and climate and also enhancing the overall performance or profitability of the organization. An organization is only as good as the people within it. So this lecture is kind of packed full of, of many things that I could spend a lot more time discussing. But first I'll start with equal opportunity employment in the law. All of these selection tools and selection procedures are really not only based on predicting performance, but making sure that there is sufficient outreach and inclusion for people of all groups and that their practices aren't doing anything illegal or resulting in adverse impact. Then I'll talk a little bit about job analysis. I could probably spend two lectures on job analysis, but it's really just determining what you need to look for in an employee. That's the biggest end result of a job analysis that impacts selection. Then I'll briefly discuss employee recruitment, and then the bulk of this lecture will be devoted to various employee selection techniques and which ones are more valid than others. So there are federal and state laws geared towards preventing mistreatment of minorities or historically disadvantaged groups of people. And these laws are enforced by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And this commission responds to and acts upon claims of discrimination, harassment, and retaliation in the workforce. So EEO laws apply to all types of work situations. So for example, hiring, right? So you have to consider are employment decisions based on legitimate job requirements, which are usually based on a job analysis that we'll talk about here in a little bit. You also have to consider EEO laws when you're talking about job placement and promotion. So are minorities being disproportionately assigned to less desirable jobs and are promotions based on merit and not favoritism? You also have to consider EEO laws when you're thinking about job assignment. So you have to consider, are minorities being disproportionately assigned to less desirable shifts or job duties? You also need to think about salary, right? So are wages based on job duties and the employee's value to the organization and not favoritism or something else? You also want to think about training opportunities. So are the training opportunities made available to all employees? Now, it's important to note that all of the laws that are enforced through equal, op equal employment opportunity make it illegal to fire, demote, harass, or otherwise retaliate against people. And that those people can be applicants or current employees. And you're not allowed to retaliate against these people because they filed a charge of discrimination or because they complained to their employer or or conveyed some sort of problem with discrimination on the job or because they participated in some sort of employment discrimination proceeding, such as an investigation or lawsuit. So it's illegal to retaliate against people who have brought forth a claim of some sort of EEO law. So according to the law, only certain groups are federally protected. So sex is protected under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and this act makes it illegal to discriminate against someone on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, or sex. So sex is included in Title VII. Also, the Equal Pay Act of 1963, this act protects men and women from sex-based wage discrimination. Intentional discrimination against women and men is illegal, but there's still no consensus in the courts over transgender people, but that is beginning to change. Now, race is also protected under Title VII, and this pertains to hiring and firing terms of employment. And according to Congress, the four races are African American, Asian American, white, and Native American. The Civil Rights Act does not require the discrimination to be intentional to be illegal. There just has to be discrimination present, even if you had a hiring practice that inadvertently disadvantaged people based on race, even if it wasn't a race based selection tool, you're still liable under Title VII. So national origin includes Hispanics. So, for example, having non job related English only requirements, that would be something that could negatively impact people based on their national origin.
So for example, in 2003, there was a casino in Colorado and they required that employees always speak English, even to each other when they weren't on the, on the floor working with customers. To encourage this requirement, the manager would yell at employees saying, English, 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 at any employee speaking Spanish. And that was found to not be legal because speaking English was not a requirement of the job. Color is also covered under Title VII, so this is specific to variations in skin color. Um, so for example, there was a situation where Applebee's paid a $40,000 settlement to a dark-skinned black manager who complained that his lighter-skinned black manager made a derogatory comment about his skin color. Age is also covered under EEO law, and this is through the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, or the ADEA of 1967. Now, this only forbids age discrimination against people who are 40 or older. It doesn't protect workers under the age of 40. So although some states do have laws that protect younger workers from age discrimination, the ADEA only protects older workers from employment practices aimed at saving money, but making it illegal to fire older workers to hire younger workers. So a lot of these laws are geared towards trying to right past wrongs. And there have been several situations where older employees who have been at the company longer and have earned raises are making more money, and the company will fire them and hire new employees to save money. And so this law makes that illegal and protects those employees who've been there for a while. Now, religion is also covered under T Title VII, and it states that it's illegal to use religion as a job requirement unless the nature of the job is religious. So, for example, priests must be Catholic, right? That would be considered something called a bona fide occupational qualification, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Now, employers are also expected to make accommodations for worshiping practices like fasting and prayer and religious attire. So like face piercing for members of the Church of Body Modification. I don't know. Also, employers have to make accommodation for days of worship. So Orthodox Jews cannot work from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, and that has to be accommodated. So here's an example of poorly handled case of religious accommodations. So Sparks Medical Center in Arkansas had a situation where this guy named Eddie Kilgore was suddenly ordered to be on call Saturdays. And as a Seventh-day Adventist, he was forbidden to work on Saturdays. And this requirement is well known by the employer. But when he refused to work, he was fired. And Mr. Kilgore filed a suit for religious discrimination and a jury awarded him $100,000 and gave him his former job back. So you need to be really careful about if you are religious, know your rights. And if you are in charge of employees, you need to know employee rights. Also, disability is covered. And this is under Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, or the ADA. Now, this makes it illegal to discriminate against a qualified person with a disability in the private sector and in state and local governments. Now, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 makes it illegal to discriminate against a qualified person with a disability in the federal government. So employers are required to make reasonable accommodation for the physically and mentally disabled. And disability is loosely defined as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the major life activities of an individual. So blindness, paralysis, even asthma and learning disabilities like dyslexia qualify as a disability. And again, reasonable accommodations must be made. And that means that employers aren't expected to drastically change what a job entails, but they may need to make reasonable op um, accommodations for an applicant's disability. Now, pregnant females are also included as a temporary disability under the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. So pregnancy is treated as any other short-term disability, and you cannot discriminate against them, and you must make reasonable accommodations. Again, just making facilities more accessible, maybe restructuring jobs, maybe reassignment to a vacant position, or modifying work schedules to help those disabled employees function in the workplace. Now, veterans are also protected under EEO law, and so the Vietnam-era Veterans Readjustment Assistance Act of 1974, that's a mouthful, and I'm never going to ask you about laws in a quiz, so don't stress about the, the laws pertaining to each one of these groups. But that law says that it prohibits job discrimination and requires affirmative action to employ and advance employment among disabled veterans, 
recently separated veterans, people who are within three years of discharge or released from active duty, and other protected veterans. Now, the Genetic Information Act of, or sorry, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008, or GINA, this makes it illegal to discriminate against employees or applicants because of genetic information. So genetic information includes information about an individual's genetic tests and the genetic tests of an individual family members, as well as information about any disease, disorder, or condition of an individual's family members. So you can't start digging in somebody's medical history because you want to save money on your insurance premiums at your workplace, right? It's illegal to do that. It's important to note that states cannot limit federally protected classes, but states can expand the coverage of EEO laws. So for example, in Nevada, Nevada covers sexual orientation, gender expression, gender identity, and the use of medical marijuana as long as you're using that off-premises and you have a prescription for it. So Nevada is one of the states that's a little bit more progressive and is expanding those equal employment opportunity laws. It's also important to note that not all organizations are legally liable for EEO laws. So just in terms of general coverage, if a complaint against a business or some other private employer involves race, color, religion, sex, including pregnancy, national origin, disability, or genetic information, the business is covered by the laws we enforce if it has 15 or more employees. And these employees have had to work for the employer for at least 20 calendar weeks in this year or last. Now, age is a little bit different. So age discrimination is really, if a complaint involves age discrimination, then the business is covered by the laws we enforce if it has 20 or more employees who worked for the company in the last 20 calendar weeks. Now, that's for private businesses. Any state or local government agency is covered by the laws for age, no matter how many employees it has. Now, equal the Equal Pay Act applies to virtually all employers. So all employers need to pay similar wages to men and women if they perform substantially equal work in the workplace. So if the employment practice doesn't directly refer to members of a protected class, then the next step is to determine whether or not the requirement adversely affects members of a protected class. So remember I said earlier, you don't have to say, oh, well, you have to be white to work at this job. You don't have to have a blatant discriminatory hiring practice against a protected class to be legally liable. If you are doing something that, or you have some sort of selection tool that inadvertently disadvantages a group who is protected, then you are legally liable. And a simple way to figure out adverse impact, or for example, a particular employment decision results in negative consequences more often for members of one race, sex, or national origin than others. So an easy way to test for adverse impact is to use the four-fifths rule that you see here. But let's give you an example of a situation where you need to check selection requirements to make sure there's not adverse impact. So for example, an employee selection requirement of a bachelor's degree would probably lead to a lower percentage of black applicants being hired compared to white applicants. So although this requirement does not explicitly mention race, it does have adverse impact because according to the US Census data, 30.3% of self-identified whites have a bachelor's degree compared with 19.8% of self-identified blacks having a bachelor's degree. If the company wanted to use a bachelor's degree as a prerequisite for employment, then they would have to demonstrate the necessity of a bachelor's degree to performance of the job to avoid charges. So you can have inadvertently discriminatory hiring practices, but you have to make sure that you can prove that that selection tool or that selection criteria is directly related to performance on the job. Now, the courts have two standards for um, adverse impact. One is statistical significance and the other is practical significance. So the statistical significance burden is met if a plaintiff or an employer can demonstrate that the differences in selection rates for two groups would not have occurred by chance alone. So you would look at the selection rates between two groups, you would do a significance test to see if those rates significantly differ. 
Now, if the statistical analysis reveals that there is not a significant selection rate difference, then you want to determine the practical significance. And that's this four-fifths rule that I mentioned earlier that you see on the screen. This is kind of like effect size, right? Statistical significance, oh, it's significant, but effect size is kind of like the so what of it. And in this case, even if you don't have a significant difference between groups, you want to see if there's practical significance. Although there's tons of ways to determine practical significance, the most popular is this four-fifths rule. And with the four-fifths rule, the percentage of applicants hired from one group is compared to the percentage of applicants hired in the most favored or the most highly represented group. And if the percentage of applicants hired in the disadvantaged group is less than 80%, of the percentage for the advantaged group, then adverse impact is said to have occurred. So if you're taking a look at this slide here, you'll see that I did some math, right? So we had a situation where we had 80 applicants in total and 50 of those applicants were white and 30 of those applicants were black. And of those applicants, 20 white applicants were hired and 10 black applicants were hired. Now, to figure out this selection ratio of 0.40, you just say, okay, well, 20 out of 50 white employee or white applicants were hired, and that gives you that 0.40, or 40% of white applicants were hired. And then same process for this selection ratio, right? Well, 10 out of 30 black applicants were hired, 10 divided by 30 is 0.33333 repeating, right? So 33% of black applicants were hired. Now at face value, you would say, oh, well, the selection ratio is lower for blacks compared to whites, but we need to know practical significance. Is it a substantial gap? And the way you figure that out is you take the proportion or percentage from the disadvantaged group and you divide that by the proportion or percentage of the most highly represented group. And then you try to see if that selection ratio is less than 80%, right? So here's this example right here, right? We said, okay, well, 33 divided by 40 is 0.825. You multiply that by 100, and the selection ratio for blacks is 82.5% of the selection ratio for whites that does not meet the criteria for adverse impact. So employment decisions based on a protected class status are illegal unless the employer can demonstrate that the requirement is a bona fide occupational qualification or a BFOQ. And that means that only members of a protected class can perform the job. So examples of um, a BFOQ, so only a female can be a wet nurse, right? Somebody who feeds a baby with her breasts. You can't do that if you're a man. Um, only a male can be a sperm donor, right? Those are pretty straightforward. Now here are some examples of non-BFOQs. So let's say UPS only hired males as package handlers under the assumption that they're stronger than females. What do you think would be the BFOQ in this situation? It's not gender. It'd be strength, right? So you could just do a strength test to see, regardless of if you're male or female, if you can handle the packages, right? So according to the courts, race can never be a BFOQ. Religion has been, like I mentioned before, you know, nuns and priests. Churches can require that priests are Catholic, but they cannot require that clergy are Catholic. Gender is sel seldom a BFOQ, and customer preference does not matter. So, for example, in 1989, Caesars Casino in Atlantic City was fined $250,000 for removing black car dealers and female car dealers to appeal to their rich, old, white male clients who preferred male dealers. So, one example of gender being a BFOQ is a, um, something that happened with Hooters in the mid-90s. A group of men sued Hooters for refusing to hire them as servers. Now, although the EEO Commission required Hooters to pay $3.75 million to the group of men who were not hired, they agreed to let Hooters continue, continue hiring only female, only female waitresses under BFOQ. 
So as the Hooters spokesperson, Mike McNeil, said, the restaurant doesn't sell food. It sells sex appeal. And to have female sex appeal, you have to be female. And the EEOC agreed with that. They said, yeah, you're not really a restaurant. You're more of a you know, sexy place for males to go or sexy place for anybody to go who wants to look at you know, sexy females. So sex appeal is what you're selling not necessarily food, and because of that, they allowed them to keep being female as a job requirement to be a Hooters girl, as they are called. And I know that, you know, sometimes places like this have a bad rap, but I have talked to a lot of people who have worked at Hooters, and it seems like they really enjoyed what they were doing. They weren't victimized. They enjoyed their job, and I think they're glad to be part of that organization. And plus, there's tons of males in the kitchen, and there's jobs for males there. They just don't want to be on the front lines. So affirmative action is one of the most controversial um, equal employment opportunity topics. And although most people associate affirmative action with hiring goals and quotas, there are actually four main strategies of affirmative action. So one is monitoring, hiring, and promotion statistics. So one of the primary affirmative action strategies is for an organization to monitor their hiring, placement, and promotion rates for men and women, minorities, and non-minorities. And such monitoring is mandatory for federal contractors, banks, and any educational program with federal funding. They have to monitor those statistics. Another strategy is intentional recruitment of minority applicants. So a common affirmative, affirmative action strategy is to target underrepresented groups for more extensive recruitment. So, for instance, advertising in magazines targeted at minority groups, um, like e Ebony for um, black people or Glamour for women. Also, you know, you could recruit at predominantly minority or female colleges or pay current employees a bonus for recruiting a member from an underrepresented group. Another strategy is the identification and removal of employment practices that work against minority employees. So such practices might involve company policy, supervisor attitudes, or the way in which the workplace is decorated. So for example, a black employee in a southern city filed a lawsuit alleging race as the reason he was not promoted. And as evidence, he cited the large embroidered Confederate flag hanging in his supervisor's office, and the flag was ordered to be removed. Another strategy for affirmative action is preferential hiring and promotion of minorities. This is the piece that gets most people fired up and can be somewhat controversial, but hopefully as I talk about this a little bit more, you'll see that there shouldn't be as much controversy as there is. So preferential hiring and promotion, minority applicants will be given preference over an equally qualified majority applicant okay that's the key there they are not going to be preferentially hired just because of the color of their skin or their background they have to be equally qualified so again this is the most controversial of all affirmative active strategies but it's important to note that affirmative action never requires an employer to hire an unqualified minority over a qualified non-minority it simply means that if a particular group is underrepresented according to employment records then the organization should do its best to remedy that situation so it is always legal to monitor employment statistics actively recruit minorities and remove barriers discouraging women and minorities from being hired or staying with an organization but preferential hiring is more legally complicated. So recently, the courts have indicated that any form of pre preferential hiring or promotion must be narrowly tailored, targeted at hiring a specific, highly underrepresented group, and it needs to meet compelling government interest. So achieving diversity in the university setting would be a compelling government interest. If the plan does not meet a compelling government interest, it's actually illegal. If the plan does meet a compelling government interest, then the courts use five criteria to strictly scrutinize the extent to which an affirmative action plan involving preferential hiring is narrowly ta tailored. So if you see these criteria on the screen, you'll see that those are the strict guidelines for making sure that your affirmative action plan is narrowly tailored. So there has to be a history of discrimination. The plan must actually benefit the people who suffered that discrimination. You also need to use the demographic characteristics of the local population to set goals, to set hiring goals, right? You can't have unreasonable goals. If you live in a place where there are very, very few Asian people and you can't recruit 
Asian people to come to your organization, then that's really not on you if you're only recruiting locally and it only makes sense to recruit locally. Also, in addition to considering just the population, you want to um, consider who out of that population is actually qualified. Again, if you don't have any qualified members of that particular group, you aren't supposed to hire them anyway, even if they're not qualified, because that is a violation of the law. Also, you want to make sure that your plan has a designated endpoint. It's really designed to help correct past wrongs, historical wrongs. Once those wrongs have been corrected and you've gotten your statistics back up to speed, then you need to terminate the affirmative action plan. So now let's briefly look at job analysis and human resources planning. So job analysis is essentially the foundation of human resource management. And without a job analysis, you don't understand what a job entails, what requirements are necessary for the job, who you're actually looking for to perform the job. You don't know how to um, assess training needs because you don't really know what knowledge, skills, and abilities are required from employees. It makes it, if you don't have a job analysis, it makes it difficult to do performance appraisal because you don't know what the criteria for performance are unless you understand the nature and the requirements and demands of the job. So again, the purpose of a job analysis is to identify the requirements of the job and the competencies or the knowledge, skills, and abilities necessary to perform them. And in many instances, a new job analysis will not need to be conducted. However, the critical requirements and competencies should be reconfirmed by subject matter experts. And a thorough job analysis will identify the job tasks and responsibilities. It'll identify the knowledge, skills, and abilities required to perform the job tasks and responsibilities. And it'll identify which of those competencies are required upon entry to the job, especially for employee selection, right? If there's certain things that you can train employees on once they arrive, then you don't have to worry so much about them having those knowledge, skills, and abilities at the onset. Now, after identifying the critical competencies, right, the necessary knowledge, skills, and abilities to perform the job, you need to determine which will be assessed in the selection process and how each competency will be measured. So are you going to use a written test? Are you going to use an interview? What is the best way to figure out what's going on with this particular job? Now, some common sources of information would be subject matter experts. Those are either employees who are performing the job or somebody else who's really familiar with the job. So supervisors are often used as well. Critical inc in incidents are also an excellent source of information about what a job entails. And a critical incident is usually a series of events or happenings that are recorded and documented by somebody in a supervisory role. And it's an incident where either an employee's behavior made the difference between poor performance and good performance. So if there's certain situations where an employee did something really, really well and you observed excellent performance, you would wanna record that incident. Also, if there were situations where something negative happened, an employee did something wrong and there was a disaster, you'd want to record that incident as well. And then you have a collection of incidences that kind of lead you to understand what are the critical competencies of a job. Cr critical incidents also help you with performance appraisal, right? So if you just tell an employee, hey, you have a bad attitude, but you don't have any documented instances of them having a bad attitude to back it up, they're not going to really be able to improve and you're not going to be able to give them constructive criticism and they may become very, very defensive. The cost of hiring the wrong employee far outweighs the investment of developing effective recruitment and selection tools. So a lot of organizations, especially small businesses, will just kind of use their gut feelings and their intuition about hiring, but they are risking some serious debt by doing that, right? It's really, really costly to hire employees, train employees, all of those things. So you wanna make sure that you put forth more effort at the beginning so that you don't have to spend a whole lot of time and money trying to train employees up because you made poor selection decisions. Now, strategic human resource planning should consider both short-term and long-term goals, training needs, recruitment, and maintaining competitive pay and benefits. And organizations should really focus on four interrelated processes. So talent inventory, that's the assessment of those knowledge, skills, abilities, and other characteristics of current employees and how they are used. So again, 
collecting critical incidents would help you with that or doing job observation or talking to subjects subject matter experts and this is really the crux of a job analysis you also need to focus as an HR professional on workforce forecasting so making data-driven predictions about future positions and what skills those positions will require also making action plans or a guide for recruitment selection training and compensation for future hires you also need to have some control and evaluation so you need to have a system of feedback to assess how well your HR system is working and how the organization how the organization met its goals so this is critical for all HR functions and IO psychologists are often employed at organizations to constantly evaluate the effectiveness of HR practices so for example how well do the selection tools that we're using predict performance now let's just briefly talk about the best practices for employee recruitment. And employee recruitment is the first process in employee selection. You have to promote the job opening, either internally or externally or both, so that you can then have a pool of hopefully qualified applicants that are a good fit for the job. So there are many different types of recruitment. Um, a lot of recruitment is being done online now through you know, job websites or just through company websites promoting jobs. There's also job fairs. There's still ads in the paper. There's point of purchase recruitment where you place job ads within the actual organization. So like for fast food restaurants, you could put a recruitment ad on the menu that explains why it's so great to work at McDonald's. And those are kind of nice because you're targeting people who are already familiar with your company. So there's tons of different ways to recruit. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of each type of recruitment strategy, but just keep in mind that you should try to target recruitment at a broad audience so that you can maximize the, the potential for diversity in your organization. And so the best recruitment strategies are attention grabbing. They screen unqualified applicants. So you have to provide realistic job preview. So telling employees exactly what they can expect on the job. Now, sometimes that can maybe steer people away from applying, but typically if a realistic job preview prevents them from applying for the job, they probably weren't a good fit anyway. Another way to screen unqualified applicants is to make sure that you include the knowledge, skills, and abilities required of people who are applying so somebody can quickly look at it and say, oh, okay, well, I don't even meet the requirements for this job or I'm not a good fit for this job. You also want to modify, mo motivate qualified people to apply. So having testimonials from employees who have worked for the organization or um, advertising the fact that you have competitive pay and, pay and benefits or advertising the fact that you'll have opportunities to telecommute and work from home or have flex time so that you can spend time with your family. Just publicizing the really, really good and beneficial aspects of being an employee at your organization. You also want to make make sure employee recruitment is cost effective. That's why the internet is taking off as a recruitment tool and timely. So you want to make sure that you are posting a job at the right time. So here's an example. So right now we are recruiting for a position for a psychology professor and most people have deadlines for applications around November and most people do their hiring and their interviews in about February. Now, we tried to hire for this position before and we didn't act fast enough and we got a late start on reviewing applications and then we didn't start calling people until March and most of those people that we were calling had already had offers and already accepted offers. So we really missed our opportunity. So timeliness is really important. Now, one type of employee recruitment strategy that I want to talk about is employee referral programs. And employee referral programs meet many of the criteria for good recruitment. So it's, you know, you're getting somebody's attention. If you're, um, you have a friend who's trying to help you get a job or refer you to a job, usually the person who's doing the referral understands whether or not they're complicated, can get, or whether or not they're qualified, they can give them a realistic job preview, so telling them exactly what they can expect. And people might be motivated because their friend seems to enjoy their job, so maybe they will as well. Now, um, a pop, so, um, sorry, employee referral programs are really popular, and there was a study that showed that 60, 66% of private organizations use job referrals in some way. And a 2007 study by the Society for Human Resource Management showed that HR professionals view employee referrals as the most effective recruitment strategy.
Some organizations even offer financial incentive for referring quality applicants. Even though research shows that most employees make a referral to help a friend or employer not to receive money. So again, employee, um, employee referrals do meet a lot of these essentials for employee recruitment. I mean, it's nice, too, because if the employee gets hired, then um, that person can help socialize their friend. Also, if the current employee does well in the job, chances are that their friend will do well because they're probably similar in terms of personality and ability. And again, that current employee can give the potential future employee a realistic job preview. But relying solely on referrals is problematic. It's important to recruit from a broad and diverse population, again, to prevent that stifled creativity or poor diversity in your workplace. Now, I quickly want to talk about assessment centers, and this is a selection technique that's characterized by the use of multiple assessment methods that allow multiple assessors to actually observe applicants performing simulated job tasks. Now, the first step in creating an assessment center is, of course, conducting a job analysis. A job analysis is the first step for any kind of selection tool. So from the job analysis, the employer or a consulting firm can develop exercises that are designed to measure different aspects of the job. So assessment centers tend to be time consuming and costly to develop, but they are a very excellent predictor of future job performance. So for really technical jobs or jobs that require a lot of leadership skills or something that's really not easy to train, then you would really want to use assessment centers to make sure that the employees who are entering the workforce are already ready to hit the ground running. So here's some common exercises that you would see in an assessment center. So one is a leaderless group discussion. So in this exercise, applicants meet in a small groups and they're given a job related problem to solve or a job related issue to discuss. And supervisory applicants may be asked to discuss ways to motivate employees, right, for example. So as the applicants discuss the problem or issue, they're individually rated on such dimensions as cooperativeness, leadership, and analytic skills. So people observe this leader, leaderless group discussion and see if a leader emerges from that discussion and then maybe target those for more leader type jobs. The end basket technique is also used during the assessment center. And this is when examples of job related paperwork are placed in a basket. Then the job applicant is asked to go through the basket and respond to the paperwork as if he or she were actually on the job. So for instance, you would get a message from an employee stating that they cannot make it to work because their car will not start. And you have to figure out how you would handle that situation. Simulations are also used in assessment centers, and they're the real backbone of the assessment center because they enable assessors to see the applicant in action. So simulations place an applicant in a situation that is as similar as possible to one that will be encountered on the job. So for example, having a police applicant write a traffic citation for an angry citizen. Work samples are also used, and it's usually when a simulation does not involve a situational exercise, then it would be called a work sample. Business games are another type of assessment center technique that allows the applicant to demonstrate such attributes as creativity, decision making, and the ability to work with others. And it typically involves a hypothetical problem or maximi maximizing outcomes of a hypothetical situation. Now, some weaknesses of assessment centers are that, again, they're very expensive, time consuming. They can also have low inner rater reliability. So somebody who is rating the leaderless group discussion may have different ratings than another person who is rating it. And also, these behaviors can overlap into several dimensions. And sometimes the safety of candidates can be compromised if you're doing a work sample or a simulation that involves danger. Personality tests are another po uh, popular way to screen employees, but you have to be really careful and make sure that whatever you are testing for personality is directly tied to performance on the job. A lot of applicants feel like personality tests aren't valid, so it has low face validity and it doesn't appear to predict performance and it may rub candidates the wrong way. But again, if you can demonstrate that yeah, personality tests do a good job predicting performance, then it's a great strategy. So there is some disagreement in research studies, but in general, the consensus is that personality is a statistically significant predictor of performance, but it doesn't really have high practical significance in most cases or has a low effect size. 
So for example, a meta-analysis of police performance found that openness to experience was the best predictor of police academy performance. So you'll see um, that personality inventories fall into one or two categories based on their intended purpose. Some personality assessments measure normal personality, like the big five characteristics that you see on your slide, and other personality inventories can assess psych psychopathology or abnormal personality. Those aren't used so much in the workplace. So again, measures of normal personality, that's just traits that are exhibited by individuals in everyday life, whereas measures of psychopathology are used to determine psychological problems. Now there's hundreds of personality inventories that measure hundreds of traits. There's general agreement that most personality traits can be placed into one of these five main personality dimensions that you see on the slide. Now of all these dimensions, conscientiousness is probably the best universal predictor of workplace behaviors. So being organized and disciplined and being careful and conscientious usually predicts performance across a variety of occupations. Now let's dig into employment interviews, which is probably the most common selection tool. If you've ever applied for a job, you've probably experienced an interview and you probably experienced an unstructured interview. So we will talk about why unstructured interviews are actually poor predictors of performance and that there's a specific type of interview called a structured interview that can increase the predictability of interviews when it comes to figuring out whether or not that person is going to be a good employee in the future. Now at first glance, the unstructured interview appears attractive due to its loose framework, its discretionary content, and kind of the conversational flow, right? You're just having a discussion, getting to know somebody. But these features make an unstructured interview very subjective, and this reduces its accuracy and invites legal challenges. Research consistently indicates that unstructured interviews have little value in predicting job performance. And unstructured interviews typically demonstrate low levels of re reliability or consistency among people who are interviewing that employee. And unstructured interviews have low to moderate levels of validity or the extent to which the assessment method predicts performance. Now, in comparison, structured interviews have demonstrated a high degree of reliability and validity and are legally defensible because they are based on actual job requirements and they're standardized, right? So all candidates are asked the same exact questions in the same exact order and all the questions are rated on a rating scale and all of the questions are directly tied to a job analysis. It's not just some sort of eh, off the cuff discussion with an, a possible employee. So because interviews are used to make employment decisions, they're subject to the same legal and psychometric requirements as any written employee test or other assessment method. And agencies are encouraged to use structured interviews because there's the benefit of consistently selecting quality candidates and reducing that risk of legal challenge. You've got more structure, although it takes more time to create and it takes more expertise to create, it still is going to allow you to make better employment decisions that won't get you in legal trouble. So here are some typical questions in an unstructured interview and you can ask yourself, have you heard these before in an interview? If you did, that person was probably just asking you some questions that came to their mind and that really are not tied to a job analysis. So why should I hire you? That's a very generic question that's not really tied to assessing if they have a specific knowledge, skill, or ability. Um, let's see, how would you describe yourself? <laughs> I doubt that's really relevant to performance on the job. And what do you really want to do in life? Chances are people aren't going to be honest with that anyway if they're trying to get a job, and it's not an accurate predictor of performance. So again, unstructured interviews are generally no good at predicting future employee performance. Researchers have investigated this question for years and have come up with these factors that contribute to this. So one problem is poor intuitive ability. Interviewers often base hiring decisions on gut reactions or intuition, but people are not good at using intuition to predict behaviors. Think about divorce rates, right? You date someone for years and you still can't predict the future. There's also a lack of job relatedness with unstructured interviews. So common questions like the one you just saw that are asked during unstructured interviews are often not related to any specific job and are at times illegal to even ask the applicant. 
Furthermore, the proper answers to these questions are really hard to determine, and the answers will likely have little to do with future performance because the questions are not job related. Also, more structure in the interviewing process helps minimize personal bias by standardizing the interaction between interviewers and applicants. So another problem is primacy effects or first impressions. So unstructured interviews are more susceptible to primacy effects, which means they're paying too much attention to their initial contact with the applicant. So to avoid this bias based on first impressions, interviewers should make repeated judgments and ratings throughout the interview, not just one overall judgment at the end. Contrast effects are also a problem with unstructured interviews. So this is when the interview performance of one applicant may impact the interview score given to the next applicant. So performance is judged in relation to recency or recently encountered others. So based on contrast effects, you would benefit by interviewing after someone who is rude and obnoxious because you would seem more pleasant in comparison. Again, having standardized rating scales and asking all the interviewees the same questions helps prevent such contrast effects. Also, interviewer-interviewee similarity can uh, lead to biased decisions with unstructured interviews, and research suggests that interviewees will receive a higher score if he or she is similar to the interviewer in terms of attitude or race, but that's not conclusive. So again, more structure, less potential bias. Also, interviewee appearance. So physically attractive and well-dressed candidates typically have an advantage over less attractive and or overweight applicants if you're relying on intuition. Nonverbal cues are another problem with interviews, so appropriate nonverbal communication is related to interview scores, and better scores are related to appropriate eye contact, smiling, and self-confidence. Those traits may be something that leads to better performance, but not for all jobs, so you have to make sure that those things are job-related if you're assessing them in an interview. And finally, negative information bias weighs more heavily than positive information. So negative information weighs on your mind more heavily than positive information. And negative information bias seems to be more of a problem when interviewers are not fully aware of the job requirements when they're doing unstructured interviews. Because less structure may make the interviewee feel like a negative response will ruin their chances at the job. So within a structured interview, there are six major types of questions. So one is a clarifier. This is just specific to the applicant. This is not standard. This is one of the few instances where you won't be asking the same questions of all applicants if you're using clarifiers. And that's because clarifiers are geared towards clarifying information in the application resume or cover letter. So you're just trying to fill in gaps in employment history or try to figure out something that wasn't clear in their resume. So for instance, you could say, hey, I noticed that you you don't have an education section on your resume. Could you tell me more about your educational background, right? You're just filling gaps. Now, disqualifiers, so the rest of these would be standardized across um, applicants. So disqualifiers must be answered in a particular way or the applicant is disqualified. So if you ask, can you work overtime without notice and that's a requirement of the job and they say no, then they would be disqualified. Past focused or behavioral description questions, ask interviewees about past experiences and how they demonstrated job-related skills to handle the situation. Because psychological research suggests that past behavior predicts future behavior. So for example, you could say, when dealing with customers, it is inevitable that you're going to get someone angry. Tell us about a time when a customer was angry at you and what did you do to fix the situation? So it'd be a past-focused question. Now, skill or knowledge focused questions are geared towards tapping the applicant's level of expertise. So asking specific questions about job related functions that they claim to understand. So you're doing a competency check, right? So for example, you could say, several months after installing the network, the client calls and says that nothing will print on the printer. What could be going on? So you're checking their knowledge of networking, right? Skill or knowledge focus. Future focus or situational questions would be something like, what would you do if, right? So the appropriate and inappropriate responses to situational questions should be based on critical incidences of employee behavior. So what did people do that was successful or not successful in the past? So for example, you could say, imagine that you told a client that you would be there at 10 a.m. It is now 10.30 and there is no way you'll be finished with your current job until 11.30. 
You're scheduled to meet another client for lunch at 12 and then be at another job at 1.15. How would you handle this situation? So it's future focused or situational questions. Now, organizational fit focus, those types of questions try to tap the extent to which the applicant will fit into the culture of the organization or the leadership style of their potential supervisors. So employees should have goals and personalities that are consistent with those of the organization. So maybe asking somebody to describe their sense of humor or why they feel like they should work at your organization. So it's important to ask organizational fit questions because organizational fit is something that you really have a difficult time training for, right? You want to make sure that you're selecting employees who are already a good fit for the organizational culture of your organization. Now, in addition to having structured questions based on a job analysis, interview questions need to have a standardized rating scale with anchors that are developed to enable the interviewers to keep score on all of the applicants responses so that you can make comparisons numerically. Now, there's three main approaches to scoring interview answers and you'll see them on the slide. One is the correct incorrect approach. So some interview questions can simply be scored based on the answer being correct or incorrect. This is usually for skill level determiners or disqualifiers. The typical answer approach has interview answers that are compared to a list of all possible answers to each question. And a panel of subject matter experts or you know current employees or supervisors would rate the favorability of each possible answer and then these ratings inform the rating scale. You can also use the key issues approach, which is a problem when, when you have a problem with the typical answer approach, it's that it's pretty much impossible to anticipate all possible responses to an interview question, right? So sometimes the typical answer approach isn't really feasible. So as an alternative, you can just look at key issues based on what subject matter experts think are key issues, and you develop the key issues that they think should be included in the perfect answer. So for each key issue addressed in their answer, they get a point. Let me show you an example of typical answers and key issues approach. So here is a sample question. So you are working as a teller and have a long line of waiting customers. A customer runs to the front of the line and yells that he bounced a check and was charged $20. Apparently this caused other checks to bounce. He then swears at you and tells you that he will not leave until the problem is solved. You are unable to check on his account because the computer is down. What would you do? So think about that sample question. And now let's look at two different ways that you could score responses to that sample question. Now, this would be a situational question, right? This would be a future focused question. So here's an example of the typical answers scoring. So see how those all those responses are very, very specific and how it could be difficult to generate all of those response options. You also see that they're rated numerically, right? So ignoring him until he goes away, that would get you a zero, whereas calling your supervisor and having her talk to the customer would be the most favorable response. So you can imagine how, once you've created this, how easy it would be to compare applicants based on their responses. Now here's an example of a key issue scoring metric. Now it's a little bit easier, I think, to generate one of these because you know specific things that need to be done in that situation. And then for each one of those key issues that are included in the applicant's response, you would give them a point. So those little blanks would be reserved for points. Now you can also weight the key issues so that certain issues are worth more points than others based on level of importance. Another really common selection tool are resumes and cover letters. Now resumes can be viewed in one of two ways, as a history of your life or as an advertisement of your skills. Resumes written as a history of one's life tend to be really long and list every single job ever worked, as well as personal information such as hobbies. Resumes written as advertisements of skills tend to be shorter and contain only information that is both positive and relevant to the job seeker's desired career. Coming from a point of um, being the chair of a selection committee, I definitely prefer the resumes that advertise skills that are relevant to the job instead of a laundry list of jobs and accomplishments from someone's past. So three rules must be followed when you're writing resumes so that you make sure that you're making a good impression. 
So the resume must be attractive and easy to read. Try to have one inch margins, legible font like Times New Roman or Arial. Don't get too creative with your font and try not to pack information in and make it really easy to follow with you know, bolded headings and bulleted lists and a really nice sense of organization. Now the resume cannot contain typing, spelling, grammatical, or factual mistakes. This makes you seem uneducated and demonstrates a lack of conscientiousness. If you're not gonna put forth effort in your resume, why would they expect you to put forth effort in your job, right? So you have to really make a good impression with this. So the resume should make the applicant look as qualified as possible without lying, right? You don't want to lie. So if hobbies, summer jobs, and listing courses that you've taken make you seem more qualified and are job related, go ahead and use them in your resume. Put everything you've got in there. Just make sure that it's job related. Don't say, oh, you know, I, I knit with my grandma on the weekends when you're applying for a job as a professor, right? That's not really going to be tied to the job performance. So cover letters should always be included with your resume. And the purpose of a cover letter is to tell the employer that you are enclosing your resume and you would like to apply for a job and to give context to why you're a good fit for that job. So it's really important that you don't just rehash your resume, but that you specifically state why you think you'll do well at the organization, and that it's clear to the person reading your cover letter that you have done your homework and you understand the organization and you're not just throwing resumes out to everybody willy-nilly without really researching the company. So before you begin writing the paragraphs of the cover letter, it's really good to start with a nice salutation. If possible, get the name of the hiring manager and mention them in your letter and make sure you spell their name right. <laughs> So the opening paragraph should be about one to two sentences long, and it just should communicate three pieces of information, right? The fact that your resume is enclosed, the name of the job you're applying for, and how you found out about the job. It's important that you include information about how you found the job because you're helping the HR department track the efficacy of their recruitment strategies. So they could directly compare how many applicants mentioned monster.com versus the point of, you know, point of purchase recruitment. Oh, I saw this at your, you know, at the counter at your organization. So it's important that you include all that information. The second paragraph should be about four to five sentences long in length and should state that you are qualified for the job. You wanna provide some reasons for why you are qualified. Again, without completely rehashing the resume, but maybe mentioning a couple things and elaborating on some of the things in your resume. The third paragraph should explain why you are interested in the position and the company to which you are applying, right? So this gets at that organizational fit. So you need to do your homework on the company you're applying to and cite specific reasons that maybe have to do with, oh, um, you know, I, I, I've realized or I've talked to people or I've read articles about how your organizational climate is so, you know, warm and friendly to employees and people feel included and how you, you know, do outreach to uh, minorities and how diversity is, you know, really a key issue in your organization and that appeals to me for these various reasons, right? You just need to make it very clear that you are purposefully applying to that company because you believe you should be working there. And then the final paragraph just closes your letter and provides information on how you can be best reached. And the signature that you put on your cover letter should leave the reader with a positive and professional impression. So maybe above your signature, use words such as cordially or sincerely. You don't want to put love in there, right? <laughs> and then you would type your name, address, and phone number below your written signature so that it's easy to find your contact information. Now, I put um, an example of a cover letter in the module for this section. So I encourage you to take a look at the cover letter that I wrote when I applied to the job that I currently have at Nevada State College. I think it's a great example, and I, I think you'll see that um, I understood Nevada State College pretty well before I got here, and I pinpointed specific reasons why I belong at the college. So here are some obvious and not so obvious characteristics of ineffective cover letters. Clearly avoid spelling or grammar errors and try not to make it too long. You have to understand that most hiring committees are reading through hundreds if not thousands of application materials and you don't want to bore them with unnecessary details. Make sure that you're not trying to use big words to sound impressive because using jargon inappropriately can really, really turn people off and not want, make them not want to hire you.
Also avoid sounding desperate or divulging too much personal information. Although, you know, you feel like you may be appealing to somebody's empathetic side saying, well, you know, I have five kids and I was recently diagnosed with cancer and I really need this job. You really need to avoid doing that because personal circumstances are not directly tied to job performance. And the whole goal of reviewing your cover letter is to predict future performance. Also, obviously, include curse words or slang. Again, don't just simply rehash the resume. Fill in gaps in the resume and explain why you're a good fit for the job. Also, avoid criticizing former employers. You don't want to leave a bad taste in the mouth of the person who is reading your cover letter and thinking, oh, well, maybe someday they'll, they'll be talking like this about me if I hire them. Keep it positive. Now, references are another really common selection tool that are used, even though they typically aren't the best predictor of performance. And we'll get into that here in a little bit. So a reference check is the process of essentially confirming the accuracy of information provided by an applicant. And a reference or letter of recommendation is really just the expression of an opinion, either in oral or written form, with regard to the applicant's ability, previous performance, work habits, character, personality, and the applicant's potential for future success. Now, unfortunately, it's not uncommon for applicants to include false information on resumes or resume fraud. So, again, the primary reason to check references or ask for letters of recommendation is to simply confirm the truthfulness of the information provided on the resume. A second reason to check references or obtain letters of recommendation is to determine whether the applicant has a history of disciplinary problems or poor attendance or sexual harassment or violence. Employers can also use other methods to check for potential discipline, discipline problems like criminal records, um, motor vehicle records, and credit reports. Now, checking references for potential discipline problems minimizes the chance of something called negligent hiring. So if an organization hired an applicant without checking their references and background, and he later commits a crime at work or puts others in harm's way, the organization may be found liable for negligent hiring if the employee has a criminal background check that indicates violent or unruly behavior. Now, a third reason to check references is to discover new information about the applicant. Former employers and professors can provide information about the applicant's work habits, character, personality, and skills. However, this information should be interpreted with caution, as any opinion provided by a particular reference may be inaccurate or purposefully untrue. So to minimize this, reference checkers should always obtain specific behavioral example, examples and try to get consistence from several reference or consist, consensus from several references. So in addition to using references to discover new information about the applicants, employers also check out blogs and Facebook pages of applicants to discover new information. This is becoming more and more common, but employers need to be very careful because browsing through somebody's social media presence may reveal protected class statuses. So, for example, if someone's looking at a Facebook page of a potential employee and finds out they're pregnant and then that person doesn't get hired and they later find out that the person browsed their Facebook page and found out they were pregnant, they could be legally liable for discriminatory hiring practices. So again, a common belief in psychology is that future performance can be predicted by past performance. So using references is one way to really get at that information about past performance. But unfortunately, research suggests that although references are commonly used to screen and select employees, they're really not that successful in predicting performance. And this issue is largely due to four main problems with references and letters of recommendation. So typically references are lenient. You're not going to ask somebody to be a reference or write you a letter of recommendation unless you know they have positive things to say about you. Also, reference providers don't always know the applicant well. So um, a really common example would be if you're applying to graduate school, you typically need three academic letters of recommendation. And if you haven't really gotten any research experience or if you've only taken one class with each faculty member or you haven't you know, become a teacher's assistant or a course assistant for a professor, those professors don't really have a whole lot to say about you. All they can say is, oh, well, Marty took my class and he got an A. But they can't really attest to your knowledge, skills, and abilities that would make you successful in graduate school. Also, there's usually a lack of agreement between references, so there's low reliability. 
and you can prevent some of those problems if you have a structured reference check. So you actually look for certain things in reference letters and score those certain characteristics that are mentioned based on how many times they're mentioned or which specific characteristics that are associated with performance on the job are mentioned in a letter of recommendation. Structure is always better. Now finally, we need to think about determining the usefulness and effectiveness of whatever selection system that you put into place. And a selection system audit involves answering this question. Does this system accurately and fairly predict those who will be successful at their job? So the majority of selection systems do not undergo any systematic or detailed analysis and evaluation of their predictive power until a problem arises. The best practice involves completing an audit on a regular basis, not as a reactionary measure. And the need for an effective audit often only comes about when an organization runs into a problem. So maybe increasing staff turnover and attrition, poor individual performance at work, maybe declining worker morale due to role ambiguity and role conflict, or maybe increasing sickness levels are happening, or maybe there's legal action being taken by candidates. So that's usually what prompts a selection system audit, even though you should be monitoring it all the time. So the ability to be able to prove to both the internal organization and any external third parties, such as insurers or external audit bodies or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, you have to be able to prove that your selection system is effective, ethical, and operating with, within the law. And also that your selection system is reducing the risk of legal problems and increasing organizational effectiveness. So optimal employee selection systems are valid. So based on a job analysis, we get at content validity, right? So you think about all the knowledge, skills, and abilities that are required on the job, and you need to make sure that you're assessing the majority of those with your selection system. Also, you want to make sure that your selection system is a valid predictor of work-related behavior and performance, or make sure that it has criterion validity. You also want to reduce the chance of a legal challenge, like I mentioned earlier. So make sure you're not invading privacy, you're not intentionally discriminating, and you're constantly monitoring adverse impact. And finally, you want to make sure that your selection system is cost effective. If you're a smaller organization, you're probably not going to want to develop a whole new set of selection tools. You'd have to hire an IO psychologist. You could probably go find shovel-ready employee selection packages that are out there that you're confident would be tied to performance in your organization. And then once you implement them, you can track and monitor how well that selection system is doing as far as predicting um, employee performance and hiring employees that stay with the job for a long time. So all of the reliability and validity measures that I exposed you guys to in your first lecture, those are all relevant to employee selection tools. I am going to focus on criterion validity, which refers to the extent to which a test score is related to some measure of job performance, which is called a criterion. So commonly used criterion or indicators of performance are supervisor ratings of performance, so like your performance appraisal score, um, actual measures of performance like sales numbers or numbers of arrests made if you're a cop. Another commonly used criterion would be attendance, so tardiness, absenteeism. Also, discipline problems like the likelihood to steal or sexually harass. Now, criterion validity is established using one of three research designs, and you'll see those three designs listed here, and I will go over each one independently. With a concurrent validity design, a selection test is given to a group of employees who are already on the job, but it's important that that selection test wasn't used to hire those employees, right? It's a new selection test that's being pilot tested among current employees. Current employees, right, concurrent validity. So the scores on the test are then correlated with the measure of the employee's current performance, and if the test scores accurately reflect performance, then there would be a significant correlation between scores on this selection test and performance. With a predictive validity design, the test is administered to a group of job applicants who are going to have the potential to be hired. 
The test scores are then compared with a future measure of performance, and ideally every applicant or a random sample of applicants is hired, and the test scores are hidden from the people who will later make performance evaluations. That way you can prevent any kind of artificial bias. If every applicant is hired, then you'll have a wide range of both test scores for the selection test and employee performance. The wider range of scores, the higher the validity coefficient will be because you're able to examine the relationship between the selection tool and performance for performers at all levels, not just the supposed good performers who were hired. So restricted range of scores is a problem with both of these designs. So if you only have data from the best candidates who were hired, you're going to have restricted range. You're not gonna have access to figuring out if low scores on the selection test predicted low performance. So it's rarely practical to hire every applicant. So most criterion validity studies use a concurrent validity design. But concurrent validity also has a problem because you're going to have restriction of range with regards to the performance, right? So if you're using this selection, if you're testing the selection tool on current employees, chances are you're not going to have very many low performing employees involved in the test because they've been fired or quit. Whereas conversely, with the predictive validity design, you've got that restriction of range with terms to the selection test itself. Because if they didn't do well in the selection test, then they probably weren't hired in the first place, right? So you still don't have the full range of scores to assess the true predictive validity or the true criterion validity of your selection test. So one very common and pretty straightforward way to determine whether or not your selection test is having the desired predictive impact, right? To make sure that your selection test is actually predicting performance is to do the proportion of correct decisions. The only information you need to do this is the proportion of correct decisions is employee test scores and the scores on the criterion or their performance measure, right? Their performance appraisal score. So you see the formulas right there on the slide and I will show you how those play out in an example. So once you have given your employees the selection test to complete, you can graph their scores on the selection test paired with their performance appraisal scores or some other measure of performance, and you put them in a scatter diagram like this. So the first step is to plot all the points where the person's test score matches their performance score. So for example, this first X right here that you see, that person, that represents a person that scored a two on the selection test and had a five for their performance or their criterion. Now, if you look at the way that these lines are diagrammed, they're based on the acceptable cutoffs for test scores and the criteria for acceptable performance. So in this example, the person is wanting to use a cutoff of 5.5 for the selection test. So anybody who gets a 5.5 or higher would be considered for employment. Also, in this example, the criteria for acceptable performance is a 6.2. So you would draw a line horizontally at that 6.2 for performance. So you're basically dividing these different data points into four quadrants, and each quadrant represents a different outcome. So in quadrant one, and you want to go um, from the top left clockwise around when you're labeling your quadrants. So in quadrant one, this represents incorrect rejections, or in other words, a situation where people actually scored really low on the test, but had really high performance. Then if we go over and we look at quadrant two, this would be a correct hire, right? Because they would have scored high enough to be selected in the first place, and they have really high performance. So they did well in the selection test, and they had really high performance, so that would be a predictive success, right? That's a situation where they did well on the test, so then they also did well at the job. Now quadrant three, this is incorrect hires. So this would be a predictive failure of the test because they scored really well on the test, but they had low performance. So in that case, the selection test didn't do a very good job of predicting how well they would do on the job. Now, if you look at the fourth quadrant, that's correct rejection. So these people did poorly on the selection test. 
and they have poor performance. So that would be another predictive success, right? So we have um, identified that they would be low performing because they scored low on the selection test. So the whole point of doing the proportion of correct decisions is to see if the proportion of correct decisions that would have been made if we were using the selection tests is larger than the current proportion of correct decisions made with the current selection test that yielded these successful employees. So once you've created your scatter diagram and you have drawn a horizontal line representing the cutoff for the performance and you've drawn a vertical line representing the cutoff for the selection test, you count the number of points in each quadrant and then you do some math. So you see the formula that's presented on the screen. So we want to take the proportion of correct decisions with the test or the correct hires and the correct rejections, right? So the people who did well on the test and had good performance combined with the people who did poorly on the test and had poor performance add that number together, those two numbers together, and then you divide by the total number of employees. So in this example, in quadrant two, so that was the, one, the people who did well on the test and actually had high performance, there was 10 of those. So we'll say 10. And then in quadrant four, that represents the people who didn't do so well on the selection test and were below the minimum criteria for performance. And if you look in quadrant four on the previous slide, there's 11 in that quadrant. So you add 10 plus 11, so we'll put parentheses around that, and then we're gonna divide that by the total number of employees in this example was 30. So 21 divided by 30 gives you 0.7. Or in other words, of this sample, 70% of the people involved had a selection score that predicted their performance. So now that looks pretty good, but we have to ask ourselves, is that better than the current proportion of correct decisions using whatever kind of selection test we're currently using? So now you have to compare that value to the proportion of correct decisions that are currently being made, not with this hypothetical selection test. So that's the top of your graph, right? That's quadrants one and two. Those are the people who meet the acceptable criteria for performance. So quadrant one had five employees in it, and quadrant two had 10 employees in it. And then we're gonna divide that again by the total number of employees, and 15 divided by 30 is 0.5. So in this case, we would want to adopt the selection test because the proportion of correct decisions with the selection test is higher than the baseline, right? So we're going to be a, do a better job at predicting employees' future performance if we use a selection test than our current rate of accurate predictions. A major issue concerning the criterion validity of tests focused on a concept known as validity generalization, or the extent to which a test found valid for a job in one location is valid for the same job at a different location. So it was once thought that the job as a typist at one company was the same as the job of a typist at another company, or that the job of a small town police officer is not the same as the job of a police officer in a big city. But research suggests that a test valid for a job in one organization is also valid for the same job at another organization. With large sample sizes, a test found valid in one company will be valid in another, provided the jobs are actually similar, similar and not merely two separate jobs with the same title. Now, the key to establishing validity generalization is meta-analysis and job analysis. And meta-analysis is used to determine the average validity of specific types of tests for a variety of jobs. So what it does is in a meta-analysis, you take several, several findings from several studies and you put them all together and you come up with an overall correlation between that selection test and measures of performance. So there was a study conducted in 1998 that was a meta-analysis from over 85 years of research. And this, you see these correlation coefficients represented here on the screen are the 
overall validity coefficients for criterion validity or the overall relationship between these types of selection tools and measures of performance. So you can see here that work samples are have the highest level of criterion validity across several organizations over the course of 85 years. And a work sample is really just when the applicant performs actual job related tasks right there on the spot. So for example, if there's a mechanic applying for a job, he may be asked to fix a torn fan belt or a truck driver may be asked to back the truck up onto a loading dock. So work samples are an excellent selection tool because they're directly related to job tasks. So they are excellent predictors of future performance. And they have a high degree of face validity because it's pretty obvious to the applicant that what they're doing is going to be related to performance on the job. Also, they're nice because by performing job tasks during the hiring process, potential employees will know what to expect on the job. So structured interviews have the next best validity coefficient there. Um, and we already discussed um, those quite a bit. So having the same interview questions for all applicants that's based on a job analysis and that's rated with a standardized rating scale. General men mental ability tests appear to be a really, really strong predictor of performance across a variety of jobs. And the major problem with general men mental ability tests, though, is that they tend to result in adverse impact. So in order to use them, you have to make sure that they are predicting the performance on the job. And oftentimes, general men mental ability tests will predict performance on the job. Peer ratings are another source of um, or another good source of um, insight into how well an employee performs on the job. But peer ratings are based on current employees, right? So you can't have a peer rating your performance if you're not already on the job. So peer ratings can really only be used for internal recruitment and promotion and job placement. Job knowledge tests are also excellent um, predictors of performance, where instead of having employees actually perform the job, you ask about different various aspects of knowledge that are required to perform the job. Now, the major problem with the highly valid predictors of performance is that for the most part, when it comes to work samples or job knowledge tests, these only work for jobs where employees are expected to know the job and have the skills upon hire, not for jobs that are more entry level that you're, you're expecting to train them up on how to do the jobs. So they don't always work for every type of job. So just because you have a selection tool that's really valid doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be useful for the specific job that you're hiring for. Um, structured interviews are probably my favorite selection tool, and that's why I spend a lot of time discussing it, because you can tailor it to however, whatever needs you need to be met, just as long as they're based on a job analysis. Now you'll see here there's some pretty um, commonly used selection tools that aren't very valid. So using age, um, graphology, which is handwriting, um, interests, those things aren't really good predictors of performance. Now interests are good predictors of organizational fit, Right. So if you're interested in the job, you're probably going to be a better fit for the organization. But just because you're interested in something doesn't mean you're good at it. Um, surprisingly to me, years of education and job experience aren't great predictors of performance. I feel like at a certain point with years of edu or with years of job experience, maybe after you've been there for a couple years, you're going to learn pretty much everything you need to know. And then everything after that really doesn't have an impact on improving your performance. So it kind of cuts off at a certain time. Reference checks are another popular um, method of employee selection, and you can see that although it's reference checks are more valid than some of these other poor predictors, they still don't have a really strong correlation. And then you see unstructured interviews are better than reference checks, but not quite as good as structured interviews.